During the time of Jesus, the Roman Empire controlled the known world. And the Romans ruled the streets of their empire through their legions of centurions. Centurion means leader of a hundred men. The New Testament mentions centurions on several occasions. However, Little is known about them, including their names. So, for the sake of our story, serving as our guide, we give you the centurion, Julius Cornelius. Julius had found himself stationed far from home, in the thriving metropolis that was Bethlehem. He was homesick, desperate to find a pizza that was as fresh and crisp as the crust of his homeland. Alas, Bethlehem was not known for its pizza. Or much else. During this time, Caesar Augustus decreed that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, which required an extensive amount of crowd control. A rather tedious job, to say the least. <sighs> Name. Joseph of the House of David, and my, uh, my wife, my wife, Mary, and children. Just the one, a son. We're naming him Jesus. <laughs> hmm. Julius immediately became suspicious of the young couple. How did they know they were having a boy? Uh. And why were they so nervous? Either they were hiding something, or they were just crazy. Julius opted for crazy. <laughs> Many years later, Julius received what his superiors called a promotion, which involved being transferred to the area around the River Jordan, where he was charged with the vital duty of crowd control. This guy's nuts. And what should we soldiers do? Don't extort money from anyone by threats or violence. And be satisfied with your wages. That's easy to say. When all you eat is locusts. Hey! Jesus! Jesus. My Lord! Hey everyone, this is the guy! Keep your eye on this Jesus character. There is something fishy about... Shh. Continuing his pursuit of the perfect pizza, Julius met with a wealthy centurion friend to pitch his idea of opening a small establishment of his own. I see an oven made of, wait for it, bricks. Huh? Huh? Sadly for Julius, the wealthy centurion's servant had just taken ill. <gasps> so he couldn't really focus on the conversation. Eager to impress his friend, Julius told him everything he knew about Jesus. Oh, he sounds great! This information did not have the desired effect. <sighs> the wealthy centurion asked Jesus to heal his servant. Lord, I am unworthy to have you in my house. Only say the word, and I know it will be done. Jesus told the centurion that not even in Israel had he found such faith, and that upon returning home, he would find his servant healed. Come, Julius, we have to get back. Julius! <laughs> Julius was dumbfounded to find that Jesus' words had come to pass. Ah! <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Not long after this, Jesus was arrested for something, and Julius found himself egging his men on, even joining them, as they taunted Jesus and gambled for his clothes. Almighty King! <laughs> However, in the midst of this, Julius began to feel rather disturbed, even haunted, by the cruelty bestowed upon a man who had seemingly committed no crime. Julius and his men followed Jesus to the hill known as Golgotha. He was ordered to keep the crowd at bay, to prevent any attempts of a rescue. And yet Julius found himself hoping that someone would do just that. But no help came. When his relief arrived, for reasons he could not explain, Julius could not bring himself to leave, and so remained till the very end. <laughs> Truly, he was the Son of God. Julius wasn't sure what was more peculiar, the coincidental earthquake or the centurion's sudden profession of faith in this Jesus. Surely he was joking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, truly, some son of God he turned out to be. I mean, right? Julius assigned himself to guard the tomb after Jesus was buried. It was a thoughtful gesture, but he really should have asked for some help. <laughs> the nights got very, very long in Judea. That night, Julius had a very strange dream. He dreamed that Jesus had risen from the tomb and had brought him the most beautiful and perfect pizza he'd ever seen. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, wanted, they wanted to use goat cheese. Seriously, they like goat cheese. Like, what are, what are, they, what are they thinking? Hey, 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 hey! Julius didn't know what to think. All he knew was he was in a great deal of trouble. They wanted to use goat cheese. Goat cheese. Julius formally resigned as a centurion and returned home. He remembered the pizza recipe from his dream and put it to very good use. Jesus was still a mystery to Julius. However, say what you will about the man, he could not deny that Jesus had a profound impact on his life. Paul the Apostle did nothing halfway. In his missionary work, he brought the message that Jesus was the Messiah. And as in all things, Paul was intense, relentless, impassioned, fearless, fervent, and completely lacking in all conventional notions of self-preservation. Even when faced with torture, imprisonment, and the threat of execution at the hands of the Romans, <laughs> Paul remained a valiant minister of the gospel. Paul's intensity began at an early age. But Paul was not always Paul. His parents originally named him Saul. He was a Roman, a Jew, and as a young man, an apprentice tent maker. 
Saul brought the same intensity to his tent making as he did to all his endeavors. Saul was also a Pharisee. A Jewish scholar and student of law, he was given the best education by one of the most respected rabbis in Jerusalem. Saul's thorough knowledge of Jewish law made him a great writer and a potent speaker. It also led him to persecute early Christians as heretics and blasphemers. Saul was greatly feared amongst the early Christians. He made it a personal mission to seek them out. and he had an uncanny talent for finding them wherever they hid in and around Jerusalem. Saul's brutality towards Christians was unparalleled. And thus he was the least likely vessel God might choose to carry forth the gospel. While on the road to Damascus, hunting for Christians, Saul saw a blinding light in the sky. And heard a voice in his ear. The voice called to Saul and asked, Why do you persecute me? <clears throat> Who are you, Lord? It was Jesus the one whom Saul had been persecuting. <laughs> <clears throat> what shall I do, Lord? Saul was commanded to get up and enter the city, where he would be told what he must do. <laughs> Saul laid in bed for three days feverish and delirious blah, blah. until the Lord sent Ananias, a Christian disciple, to heal him. <coughs> <coughs> Persuaded by the experience, Saul converted, got baptized and became known as Paul, champion of the gospel. Paul brought the same intensity to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ that it previously brought to persecuting Christ's followers. <laughs> Paul first joined Barnabas in his missions. Or more accurately, Barnabas joined Paul in what was now Paul's mission. Paul performed many signs and wonders to demonstrate the truth of his message. For example, Paul blinded an evil sorcerer in Cyprus. Rah! He converted Gentiles in Antioch. Rah! He healed a lame man in Lystra. Rah! <laughs> and was stoned and run out of every major city in Asia Minor. Rah! When Paul wasn't preaching, he was writing, following up with those he ministered to with many, many letters filled with admonishment. Rah, 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 rah. But also encouragement. Rah, 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 rah. Paul rarely came up for air as he seized every opportunity to spread the good news of Christ. Rah. Unfortunately, his intensity did occasionally take its toll on his personal relationships. <laughs> Paul brought along the apostle Silas for his next mission, which took them to Philippi. But upon converting a fortune-telling slave girl, 
they were promptly beaten and thrown in jail. That night, Paul, undaunted, sang hymns and prayers at the top of his lungs. At midnight, an earthquake shook the foundations of the prison, freeing them. Paul subsequently baptised the jailer on duty, as well as his entire family. This turn of events provided Paul with what some would regard as wholly unnecessary encouragement. With his newfound momentum, Paul doubled his efforts, despite increasing persecution. Paul soldiered on, spreading the gospel, starting new churches and supporting them with his many letters. Letters to the Corinthians, the Galatians, the Thessalonians, the Romans and many others, right up to the very end, when Paul was executed by order of the Roman Emperor Nero. <laughs> Paul's execution did nothing to stifle his voice. In fact, 13 books in the New Testament are attributed to Paul, and much of our understanding of Christianity is due to Paul and his ceaseless work on behalf of Christ. Roar! 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 While details on Lydia are fairly sparse, we know one thing for certain. She was not a conformist. In a time when most people rarely ventured very far from where they were born, Lydia chose to settle not only in a different city, but an entirely different country, far removed from her family or any kind of support. Then there was the issue of her being an independent merchant. <laughs> while simultaneously being a woman. Which was generally frowned upon. Hello, Claudius. How were sales today? Uh, oh, well, uh, <clears throat> not bad. Can't complain. Mm. Good. Lydia never let something so petty as social stigma stand in her way. She did what she felt called to do, and she did it exceptionally well. Welcome home, madam. Thank you, Geoffrey. Lydia dealt primarily in purple cloth, an exceptionally rare and valuable commodity. It is believed that she would have travelled extensively across the region to sell it, as it was a very profitable enterprise. As an independent woman living in the first century, she had achieved more than most would have deemed possible. But despite all that she had, and all that she'd overcome, something was still lacking though it was unclear what exactly that something was. Yep, no idea. As part of her quest to uncover this elusive something, Lydia began taking a vested interest in religion and true to the spirit of her completely unconventional lifestyle, decided to become a worshipper of Yahweh despite the fact that she was not a Jew. Hey, look, Bart, it's that non-Jew Jew. Ha! Good morning, gentlemen. How are you today? Um, hello. Mm. In the city of Philippi, the Jewish population was so minuscule that there wasn't even a proper synagogue to worship in. So she 
and a small group of women had to worship by the river on the outskirts of town. Something Lydia assuredly had a hand in organising. Let us pray. It was during one of these informal services that two missionaries arrived, the Apostle Paul and his associate Silas. Paul began sharing the message of Christ with them. Christianity was highly controversial. But when Lydia heard Paul's message, it pierced her very soul. She sensed an undeniable truth in his words. She knew that this, this was the something she had been missing. You know, I think this is what I've been missing. And so while it was inadvisable at that time, in that region, for a successful single, independent, foreign female merchant, Gentile worshipper of Yahweh to also become a Christian, she immediately converted and was baptised. Ra ra Christ, ra ra! Along with her entire household. After this, Lydia invited Paul and Silas to stay at her home. Oh, please. Ra! <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, what I meant to say is, we appreciate the offer, but... Uh, I insist. No, no, now I'm afraid that's not possible. You see, we have got to... to... May I take your sandal, sir? Uh... Let me show you to your rooms. Uh... I, uh... Rar? It quickly became apparent to Paul why Lydia was so successful as her powers of persuasion seemed to border on the mystical. A short time after this, Paul and Silas were arrested, which was nothing new to them. In fact, Lydia's warm hospitality was a significant departure from their typical reception in most cities. As it turned out, Paul and Silas' imprisonment was cut short by a massive earthquake, which they both agreed was quite miraculous. Almost as miraculous as what they found when they returned to Lydia's home. Lydia had been busy transforming her home into what was the first house church on the continent of Europe. This would be just the beginning. Lydia had found her calling. She now knew what to do with all that the Lord had given her. She began taking full advantage of her wealth, status and social network to share her newfound faith and support fledgling congregations. And Lydia's faith in action may very well have also served as a model for Paul as he went on to work with many other wealthy and powerful women who were key in establishing and sustaining communities of followers all across the map.